our next speaker is Courtney Hameister. And obviously you have a very excited group of people ready to hear you speak. Courtney is a fellow broadcaster um, whose anxiety pushed her off the air and into a year that she describes her year of living relatively dangerously, which I really do love that description. She's going to talk about how you can reframe your story and how it can change your life. So if you guys didn't hear me, um, make sure you grab this yellow journal. You're going to use this during Courtney's talk and then there are tons of pens on the table, so grab that. And welcome Courtney. So I'm one of those people who does have an annoying power PowerPoint. Um, uh, thank you. Uh, I, I worked hard on it. Um, sorry, I'm just going to set a stopwatch so that I know how much time I have, because I have a lot to say, bitches. Sorry, I called it bitches. I like all of you. Um, so, <laughs> so um, and we do have, I'm, I am going to ask you to do, to, do a, uh, to do a little exercise later. So. Um, so my talk is, uh, is called My Year of Living Relatively Dangerously. Um, uh, so I've always been really a wildly neurotic person, but I also weirdly wanted to talk in front of large groups of people like you guys. Um, so in 2003, I became the host and head writer of a radio show that, rec that recorded in front of a live audience right here in Portland. It was called Livewire. And so, I was also the head writer, and so on Mondays at our writers' meetings, what I would call my dread ball would appear in the middle of my chest, and then as the week towards the show progressed, that dread ball would grow in my chest to become sort of like, first it was cantaloupe-sized and then watermelon-sized, and I had trouble breathing, and then by the day of the show, I was essentially just walking around in a hamster ball of anxiety. And I don't, if you have anxiety, it sort of dulls the world, right, through the plastic of your anxiety hamster ball. Um, and then, uh, actually, on the eve of, the, of our ninth anniversary show, uh, that dread ball turned into a two-day OCD-inspired panic attack. And this guy, amazingly, we were having him uh, on the show. He was just going to be a guest, and I suggested that he actually host it. And the next night, the worst and best thing happened, and that was that the show was absolutely, perfectly fine without me. Um, I was like an ambivalent parent, like dropping off their well-adjusted, independent student off at college, just like, hooray, shit. Um, <laughs> so, so that was really hard for me. So I went to a therapist and she told me that in addition to a very intermittent case of uh, intrusive thought OCD, um, I also had generalized things or in anxiety disorder or GAD um, for most of my adult life. And also, what the hell are you doing hosting a live radio show? <laughs> What's wrong with you? Um, and what was interesting about being diagnosed with something, and many of you may have had this experience as well, is suddenly things made sense. Suddenly my pessimism, my, my, suddenly my, my pessimism made sense, right? Because I had these deep ruts in my neural pathways that were telling me that stuff was going to suck, and that was from my anxiety, because that's what anxiety does, right? Um, but I'd lost this wonderful thing, and I didn't want to do that again, so I wondered, was it possible to teach my anxious brain that everything was going to be okay by retraining it, taking it into the world like you would a child. Uh, teaching it what's there to hurt you, what's there for fun, like sea turtles and roller coasters and vodka. And that's how I created my OK Fine Whatever project. I called it OK Fine Whatever because that's what we anxious Eeyores say when forced to do things Tiggers find fun. I would spend a year doing things that scared me and then write columns about them when I realized that I didn't die. But I'm, but I'm anxious, right? So I didn't do things that threatened my life. I did things that most people would find awkward but kind of wouldn't really think twice about. It was like exposure therapy but to the entire world. So uh, I went to a 90 minute, uh, I went and spent 90 minutes in a pitch black sensory deprivation tank because I'm afraid of the dark and claustrophobic. Uh, because a lack of sensory input is supposed to shut down the lizard part of your brain, you're supposed to have these creative epiphanies in there. But I was so stressy 
that all I could do was lie there and just my brain was going just wondering things like, how can Pharrell Williams think a room without a roof is happy when it's missing such an important component? <laughs> Uh, I went to an escape room in the basement of a warehouse with a group of friends who loved puzzles and LARPing, and that's where I realized that my inner child was dead. Um, <laughs> like, they just relished in play acting, and they, oh, we have to find the code before the commander's office blows up. And I just kept reminding them, they are not going to blow us up because that would be a horrible business model. <laughs> I went to see Samantha Hess, a professional cuddler at Cuddle Up To Me. Uh, I went to her to help me get over my fear of talking to strangers by spooning with one. Uh, I learned actually that there's not much difference between being cuddled by someone who loves you and being cuddled by a stranger except for a lot of awkwardness at the outset. And I know that you want to snark because the entire internet lost their minds when she started her business, and snuggling for money is an easy target. But as a person who spent most of her adult life not being touched, you have no idea the mental and physical toll that takes on you. How you start believing you never deserved what you haven't gotten. So if someone doesn't have the thing you get every day and they want to pay someone for it, let them freaking have their transactional cuddles. You heartless bastards. First bitch is not that. It's not, I, I was, I'm talking to the internet. That's what, that was the internet, not you guys. Um, I uh, was also on this massive dating binge that year, and I went to a place called Wax on Spa for a Brazilian. I wanted to just kind of up my labial game. Um, so if you're wondering what it's like to get a Brazilian, um, it's a lot more painful the closer you get to what I will call ground zero. Um, <laughs> So the difference between having hair ripped from your outer and inner labia is similar to the difference between getting your eyebrows plucked and being impaled on an iron fence. <laughs> um, yeah, if you want to know what it, these things are, I can tell you later. Uh, I went to Shebop, um, which is the greatest sex store in the, in the history of the world, and sorry, Lincoln High School girls, I took a fellatio class uh, where I learned all the ways in which my oral fixation makes me an overachiever. Um, so my biggest takeaway from that class was, was about learning how to ask for what you want and ask your partner what they want. Sex is unique in that there, is no, there isn't another human interaction wherein each of us believes that the other person should inherently know how to please us. Imagine if your hairdresser asked you what you'd like and you responded, I could tell you that, but if I did, I'm afraid you'd lose your sense of power as a stylist, and it would take all the fun out of the haircut for me. What I'd like for you to do is start cutting my hair and then attempt to deduce the haircut I want by reading subtle verbal and physical cues that might lead you in the right direction. This might be a slight change in my breathing or an infinitesimal head shift towards your hand. It's time to get over this idea that it's only romantic if they magically guess exactly what you want. Besides, the real magic is in the vulnerability it takes to ask and answer those incredibly awkward questions. So what came of all this? Miraculously, my column turned into a memoir and I turned into an author, which I'd always dreamed of but never thought possible. It turns out that your life becomes a lot more memoir worthy when you live for at least part of it in your discomfort zone. I also met someone for the first time in over a decade. I, I slept with so many men that year to find him. Um, and I'm so glad I did, and not just because it was, I really enjoyed it. Um, but because I discovered exactly what and who I like, and it turned out to be that guy. Um, as for other things that changed that year, uh, I haven't turned into the most adventurous person I know. I haven't hiked the Pacific Crest Trail alone. I did, I did hike Mills End uh, Park in downtown Portland at 452 square inches. It's officially the smallest park in the world. Uh, it's more my speed. But did, but did all that time in discomfort zones change anything? Yes, it did. I know you want me to say that there was some huge change, but that's simply not how it works. Change is incrementally, frustratingly slow, and you can't magically go from pessimist to optimist, but you can create a happy ending to a hard story. Last fall, after interviewing hundreds of people on the Alberta Rose Theatre stage, I was interviewed on the same stage about my new memoir, filled with pride in the exact spot I'd always been filled with trepidation. So that alone was more than worth it. But the more important change was just one word, interesting. 
When faced with a new experience, instead of saying, that sounds terrifying, I would say, well, that sounds interesting. And that was enough to make a huge difference. I was proud of myself for my year of living relatively dangerously because I'd done it all as an anxious person. In fact, whatever I had accomplished in my life, it was because I managed to push through this pathology that told me that everything was gonna suck. We call Superman brave, but he flies through life with the knowledge that nothing can harm him except kryptonite, this thing no one has. That's not bravery, that's just being indestructible. I think anxious people deserve capes because we force ourselves to get up put on our ill-fitting lycra tights, and leave the house daily in a world where we know 13 people are killed by vending machines every year. <laughs> and that's terrifying. So, so if you struggle with anxiety, there's probably a question rolling around in your head right now. Hey, Courtney, I want to change my life. Do I have to go to a sensory deprivation tank and get a Brazilian and go to a sex club on Build Your Own Burrito Night, which is also something that I did? And the answer, that, the answer that is no, you don't, but I would, I'd recommend it. I enjoy them all. Um, I believe strongly that bravery is a muscle. And the more times you inch out the boundaries of your comfort zone, the more you'll get into the habit of doing so. Uh, but there were three shifts in my life that helped me to see it differently after this experience, and I want to talk about each briefly. Um, what is, I think, if you can't read that, I think it says, I chewed the face off a stuffed elephant. Um, <laughs> dog shaming. Um, so this wasn't so much of a shift as it was a realization that I have absolutely no filter. Um, but here is the power of oversharing. We all know what happens when we hold on to shame. It starts small, but then the longer we keep it in our brains, the more it snowballs, right? One morning it rolls around something your mom once said, and then the next morning it rolls over a thought error you picked up in fourth grade and it just rolls in all of these things until it takes up the majority of your brain space. And then what happens when you finally screw up the courage to tell someone, someone that you love, someone that you know cares about you? Unless you killed someone, what usually happens is that that person says, Anjus, I just did that last week, or I thought I was the only one, thank God, or as my Aunt Sandy says about family, wow, you really screwed that up. You want a sandwich? Um, so telling our stories just melts those snowballs of shame until they're manageable, right? Um, and the other powerful aspect of sharing our shame is the effect it has on the person we've shared that story with. I've spent over a decade standing in front of crowds and sharing humiliating stories and hearing the audience's laughter. And what that laughter is, is the audience recognizing their own experience in you. And in that moment, both of you feel less alone, and that's magic. So reframing, if, if a lot of you are mental health professionals, then you probably uh, know what reframing is. Um, but this is something that we writers do all the time, and especially memoir writers. Um, but it's also a psychological term that, uh, uh, so cognitive ref reframing is a psychological term. And a brief definition uh, is, it is a psychological technique that consists of identifying and then disputing irrational or maladaptive thoughts. Uh, it's uh, reframing is a way of viewing and experiencing events, ideas, concepts, and emotions to find more positive alternatives. So <laughs> um, I'm going to tell you a kind of a long story, and you're going to think, what does this have to do with cognitive reframing? But I promise I will bring it back around in the end. Um, to give you some context, this is a story from my book, um, and it's about me and the guy that you saw with a backpack. In the book, he's called number 28 because he was my 28th first date that year. And this is where we begin the story. By April, I'd been seeing number 28 for three months. Because of that, many of my other adventures started to quiet down. But that doesn't mean I wasn't still exploring new territory. Between December and April, I grabbed my wrench, strapped on my waders, and began plumbing the depths of emotional intimacy. I haven't experienced a lot of romantic intimacy in my life, but I'm no stranger to emotional intimacy because if, as we've already established, I'm an oversharer. And that didn't stop when I started dating. Someone, should make, someone would make a lot of money selling shock collars to daters like me. You could program in certain phrases like heroin overdose, short prison stay, or mashed potato codependency. And as soon as the first couple syllables came out of your mouth, you'd get a shock. Get on it, science. 
So I'm known to leap past levels of intimacy, but more impressively, three months into my relationship with number 28, I actually created a level all my own. I call it the bladder oversharing level. <laughs> One night in early April, I was making dinner at number 28's house. Uh, lucky for me, he was used to cooking for two kids and didn't have a history of dating foodies, so my Thai stir-fry struck him as interesting and exotic and not pizza. <laughs> Number 28 was in the kitchen with me chatting as I cooked. It was a deeply domestic scene and the significance of it wasn't lost on me. At one point he said something funny. At the same moment, tragically, I happened to be gnawing on a chunk of baby carrot. I proceeded to inhale a relatively large chunk of it, which caused me to start coughing. And not just small, ladylike coughing, but the kind of full body hacking that happens when your esophagus believes it's in a life or death struggle with a vegetable. And that's when it happened. I pretty much peed my pants. It wasn't one long pants peeing, but a series of smaller cough-induced <laughs> urine explosions that escaped the bounds of the now urine-soaked crotch area until it was just wasn't a pants peeing anymore, it was a shoe peeing. <laughs> Sorry, enjoy your breakfast. One would think that in a situation like this, I'd be with my esophagus, just straight up putting all my energy into surviving this carrot battle, but all my brain could do was think, did I just fucking pee on my boyfriend's floral kitchen mat? Did that just happen? Finally, the coughing fit ended. I stood there with pee in my shoes and wished for a teleportation device that never came. Do you need anything, he asked. I don't know, I thought. Adult diapers? A pressure washer? A time machine so I can go back and tell four years ago me to do more kegels? <laughs> At this point, I was still in denial. My mind raced with, with ways that I could distract him for long enough to get upstairs and shower. Should I start a fire? I could start like a small one, not big enough to do any real damage, just big enough so that the cleanup would take approximately like 20 minutes. And then I started wondering what percentage of house fires were started by people who just peed their pants and were just trying to cover it up. So I finally decided to tell him because the small pool of urine at my feet was gonna give me away no matter what, unless the entire kitchen was engulfed in flames. Um, and so I just said, underwear? Cause I'm pretty sure I just peed my pants. Ah, intimacy. Those memorable thresholds we cross, like the first kiss, the first time we cry in front of our partner, and the first root vegetable induced bladder explosion. So here it is. Here's the first moment that I can't hide my humanity from you no matter how hard I try. I thought back to the reasonably well-dressed and well-spoken bon vivant I presented myself as on the second date. That was such a cute skirt, it didn't have any pee on it. I remember the social butterfly I became when we met all of my friends at Valentine's Day. And then there was the decent cook who enjoyed a good laugh, the person he'd known just three minutes earlier. Dead, they were all dead. <laughs> Or not dead exactly, but definitely flailing around on the wet kitchen floor and now needing being, in need of being woven into a new incontinent version of me. He ran upstairs to get me a pair of his boxer briefs while I went into his bathroom and took off my wet underwear. And I'm sorry about this, I really, really am. I just put them in my purse. I rinsed off as best I could and then used his hand towel, towel to dry everything and then just refolded it into the towel rack so the unused side was available for future users who hadn't peed themselves. When I emerged from the bathroom, I told him to stay out of the kitchen while I cleaned up the floral kitchen mat with Lysol, all the while wondering how one brings sexy back after an incident like this. Justin Timberlake probably never peed his pants while making dinner for Jessica Biel. Three months is a significant point in a relationship. It's often that fisher cut bait moment when we start to think, I've already invested three months in this. Is there enough to invest more, or should I come up with an escape plan? This is what was going through my head as I finished cooking dinner and we chatted. Him, anyway, I think we'll be able to get the project back on schedule as long as things go smoothly this week. My brain, I'm sorry, I didn't hear what you just said. I peed my pants or <laughs> I was distracted for most of the remaining food prep, but then we finished cooking and sat down and had a lovely meal, and I forgot a little. Give me the right entree and I'll forget that I accidentally killed someone with my car. Then we sat on the couch where we chatted some more, made a couple of hilarious adult diaper jokes, then made out. So he must have forgotten a little too. It turns out sexy did come back just a couple of hours later. The only way I can explain it is that I was dating someone who liked humans. I woke up the next morning and cooked breakfast without incident. I looked across the table at him as I ate my eggs and I realized that while I wasn't planning on testing the boundaries of his affection for me like that again, I knew I would. 
again and again against my will. Why do I know this? Because I once put a tiny candy bar down my pants so I wouldn't eat it. <laughs> True. Because I cry when I get angry, which makes me angrier. Because I like John Denver, unironically. These are bombs, thank you. These are bombs that are just waiting to go off someday, and they will go off. Relationships are all fun and games until someone pees or pants or likes John Denver. And that's where the real intimacy begins, when you realize the other person can forgive, disinfect his kitchen, and move on with his affection for you largely intact. And when that happens, your affection for him grows because of his ability to do so. I think falling in love is half attraction to the best parts of a person and half gratitude for their ability to forgive the worst parts of you. Whatever the reason, we seem to be falling for each other. So if you're looking for relationship advice, I'm kind of an expert now. I just tell people to buy a family-sized can of Lysol and hope for the best. <laughs> so that's my P story. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> kind of long. Um, so um, why did I just tell you that humiliating story? Um, well, it's partially because I want to shrink my shame snowball about it, right? Um, uh, but the other reason is that it's an example of reframing. So it could have just been a humiliating story uh, of the time my lack of kegels came back to haunt me, right? Um, but it wasn't. Because I'm a humor writer, I'm tr I've trained my brain to seek out the absurd and funny moments in stories. And because I'm a memoir writer, I'm always looking for the larger meaning of stories, to the universal truth that is inherent in my own experience. So in this case, this wasn't just a story about my incontinence, although it was that. It was also the story of the first time my boyfriend of three months saw my humanity and accepted me as I was, which happens in almost all relationships, right? You get to that point. They just, it's like, well, I'm, me I'm messy as hell. Um, through reframing, it became sort of a love story. Uh, a super weird, gross love story, but a love story nonetheless. And the great thing about that is if we're made up of our stories, and I think that we are, and you can actually change one of your life stories for the better, you're quite literally changing your life, which is a pretty neat trick. So um, I wanted to do this little exercise with you guys this morning. Um, I am lucky enough to be working with an extraordinary new nonprofit called Create More Fear Less. And the website is just createmorefearless.org for more information. So this group is very close to my heart in the same way that OSH International is because they go into schools and they help anxious kids to work through their anxiety and reframe it in the way Melody was talking about. Um, they reframe it as something that gives them a powerful imagination and it helps keep them alive like it did sort of back in prehistoric times when being anxious about you know, a saber-toothed tiger was actually a pretty smart move. So, the program utilizes art and writing, and I wanted to see if we could use one of their exercises called Capture the Feeling to help illustrate how writing can help give us a new perspective. As I said, it's an exercise for kids, but when I did it myself, I found it to be very powerful. Um, and maybe it's because I'm massively immature, but let's just try it. Um, so you, you have pens on your tables, and you have those little Create More Fear Less notebooks. So take out your notebooks, and we are going to do a metaphor exercise. Um, and this is right out of the Create More Fear Less playbook, which you can see on the website at any point. So start thinking about anxiety and worry in your life. So what does that feel like for you? Do, you? do you feel it in your body? Do you feel it in your head? When I have anxiety, it lives right here in my chest. It feels like a buzzing that kind of keeps me from breathing deeply. So where does that live? So in your journal, Try comparing your worry or anxiety to, the, to uh, number one, an object or thing. Is it like an alarm clock? Is it like a yo-yo? Is it like a speeding train? To, you could compare it to an animal. Is it like a monkey, a bear, a boa constrictor? You could compare it to the weather. Is it like storm clouds, a tornado, a hurricane? Uh, it could be a sound. Does it sound like a bear roaring in your brain, an elephant stomping, plates breaking? Uh, or a place or a situation, it's like I'm trapped in a box, stuck on a merry-go-round. So kind of just make a list of things that your anxiety or worry is like. Um, uh, a few examples, my worry is like an alarm clock I can't turn off. When I worry, it feels like my head is full of bees. When, it, when I worry, it sounds like the stomping of 100 elephants. So just kind of keep writing them until you get to one that you're like, that's it. 
that's really what it feels like. And I'll just give you like a minute or a couple of minutes to do that. Everybody just, when you're done, just look up. So I kind of get a sense for when everybody feels like they've hit something. Okay. So now, on a new page in your journal, I want you to write down your favorite metaphor from your list. Just turn the page and write it on the left-hand side. And then once you do that, see if you can add some more details to really capture that feeling. Like if worry feels like my head is full of bees, I could write the bees fly around inside my head, the buzzing gets louder and louder. It's like the longer they're trapped inside, the angrier they get. And I'll give you a minute to do that. Now at the end of your list of details, write a little bit of advice to yourself. So what can you remember in that moment to help you get through that anxiety or worry? Like see if you can make your advice relate to your comparison, right? So if I'm, if I'm writing about, tr about bees trapped in my head, um, I can say, but I know the bees will eventually fly away. This one is one of my favorites. Um, it was a kid that said uh, that worry was like plate smashing up against the wall, but he knew at some point he'd run out of plates. <laughs> I love it. So once you have the metaphor and your advice to yourself, just, just do a simple illustration of, of it. What do you think it looks like to you? And it can just be a representation. It doesn't have to be something amazing. You don't have to be a, a fantastic artist. So does anybody, um, anybody who's in the front who I might be able to hear want to share what their metaphor is? Yeah. Um, I put, uh, feels like running through molasses, the wall of molasses. That's great. That's awesome. Anybody else? Yeah, over here. Being swallowed by mud. Oh my gosh, that's great. <laughs> that's awesome. I love that. Anybody else? Oh right. Oh sorry. Uh, she said uh, it's it's like what was it sinking into mud? Being swallowed by mud, but mud washes off. Um, here, yeah. There's no more ice cream in the world. Oh my gosh. What's the solution? Are you going to make some? Make sure you've got an ice cream maker. Too. Okay, <laughs> that's good. So hers is, there's, it, it feels like there's no more ice cream in the world, but she just is going to make sure she always has an ice cream maker and cream. Anybody else? Uh, yeah. Um, sure, you in the white. Totally, that's so great. She said it's, it's like being on the roller coaster and you're at that point where it's just about to go down and you just know it's gonna be really bad, but at some point the ride's gonna be over. So if you guys just wanna show your, if you want to, there's no you know, pressure to do that, but if you wanna just show your metaphors to your table mates, 
um, for a couple of minutes, that would be great. So I'm, uh, I'm running at the very, very end of my time. Um, so metaphor is really powerful for me because it helps me see something in my life in a whole new way, and perspective is always a good thing. And I just wanted to say that um, Kathleen Lane, who started Create More Fearless, is here this morning. She's right sitting at this table. So if anyone wants to talk to her about the program, please do so. Um, uh, she loves talking to strangers. She's just her favorite thing to do. Um, so now hopefully you have something to frame to remind you about reframing when you go home. Um, so just my last, my, the last thing that I, that I want to say is that I would hope that if you continually are reframing um, the, you know, the past stories of your life, that it, that it will help you um, to think differently and it will actually affect the way that you see the world every day and affect making you pre-frame it, right? To be brighter or in my case, just not so dark anymore because for me that's a real victory just to not have any judgments initially or expectations, right? Um, so hopefully uh, as, as you do this, you can just sort of train your brain to continually think differently about about life and it's not gonna solve all of your problems and so there's certain trauma that you simply cannot reframe. Um, but I think once you sort of get used to it, uh, it it's, it's absolutely changed my life for the better. Um, and I just wanted to um, say thank you uh, to Gayathri and Ash International and all of the amazing um, uh, people on the board and the volunteers. Um, it's been a real pleasure. Um, um, you probably can't read this, but it says, relax, nothing is under control. And I love it. I love it so much. <laughs> you can just let go. Um, yeah, and also if anybody wants me to sign a book, I'm happy to do it. I'm just up at this front table. Thank you so much.